Welcome back, everyone. Let's uh, discuss pol um, security now. Two persons have died following an attack by bandits in Makoro Iri village in Kajuru, local government area of Kaduna State. The Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs in Kaduna State, Samuel Arwan, says the bandits invaded the remote village and shot dead the two persons. In another scenario, troops of Operation Safe Haven have rescued three travelers from armed bandits along the Gidon Wire Godogodo Road in Jamaa, local government area. On Friday in Zamfara State, the abducted students of the College of Agriculture and Animal Science Bakura Zamfara State have regained their freedom 12 days after gunmen wicks them away from the institution. And in Niger State, three months later, some of the students uh, were freed months after gunmen stomped their school in Rafi local government area of Niger State where they took away 93 children. And the chain of rescue and freedom continues of abducted persons. Good news for the families of these people and majorly students who are taking out of their school. I'm now being joined to give insights and some professional expertise into the conversation by Group Captain Sadiq Shewu, a retired Air Force officer and a security and defense consultant. Also with him is Mr. Kabir Adamu, a security consultant. Both of them very knowledgeable and deeply intelligent security experts. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your time tonight. Let's begin the conversation now. Um, let me begin with the group captain. Give us a sense of what this means uh, in terms of uh, the operations of the military and, of course, even the police in the rescue. We've seen this happening at least in the last one week. The series of the rescue and the freedom of uh, some of the school children and the persons that have been abducted. How do you assess the situation? What led to it? And how do you hope that this can continue and sustain to get everyone that is in the den of these bandits out? Uh, thank you very much. Well, uh, what I would like to say, while the details of the rescue are not completely out about how the rescue was carried out, but it is logical to believe that... Uh, these bandits cont uh, continue to operate with impunity, seizing our children, our wives, our relatives. The more they do this, the more the security forces will understand their modus operandi, whether it is by way of transportation, whether it is by way of how they attack, how they choose their targets, and where they keep them. And that being the case, as long as lessons are being learned, we expect to see more and more success in uh, you know, getting people abducted freely. However, uh, I always, uh, you know, sympathize with the security forces, whether it is the military, whether it is the police, whether it is the DSS. They are operating below capacity for so many reasons. So the government should not, we should not, uh, you know, we should not uh, assume that the security forces are having all that they require, you know, to carry out this operation. If you look at the large expanse of land or large expanse of forest where, where, where the security forces are operating, without mobility assets, without communication assets, without even boots on the ground, enough boots on the ground. It is really, really a Herculean task. Sometimes in, this, in these areas, if these people see people and enter, it is like looking for a needle in a haystack. So the government, while uh, you know, uh, uh, rejoicing with the relative success we are having, we are not yet there. And I will continue to call for more capacity building for the armed forces. Uh, one, one, good, one, one thing to note, is that you know the uh, when, when when a kidnap has taken place the best time or the highest success is immediately after the kidnap if you are going to recover if the people have a very long head start it becomes more difficult for you because even if you know where they are maybe they have taken a defensive position and remember they are holding valuable property your children your wives so even the tactics you are going to use or the methods are, you do not have unlimited tactics you have to select very well so what do we do we try to reduce the reaction time from when they strike and to when we get to them. And how do we do that? We need more and more, this is what I'm thinking, we need more and more smaller units embedded in some of these communities so that the nearer you are to the place of abduction, definitely it will, be, it will take a shorter time for you to react. But right now, if all people are staying you know, far away from places you have to deploy, of course, the reaction time is going to be long. And that is, most of the time, that's what we see. If the reaction time is going to be very long, 
then definitely the chances of rescuing you the best chance is to catch them while they are while, while, hot pursuit while they are going but by the time they arrive they are you know they are dog in uh, emplacement it becomes more difficult to effect such rescues let me uh, check on uh, mr adamu on uh, some of these issues that you have raised uh mr adamu uh, one we wonder when uh, the description of the terrain of these bandits are being discussed and uh, how they go about what uh, this dastardly act when we imagine uh, what goes on and how the security operatives hope to achieve uh, getting at them but what in your own mind do you think may have been responsible for these recent successes of getting people freed out of their den um, thank you, uh, Shiu. Um, in my opinion, what, what we had, apart from one, one instance, is uh, a case of relief, not, not necessarily rescue. Um, in other words, it was the bandits that, um, be, that relieved um, the, their victims after their parents paid uh, money. Uh, very different from a situation where, uh, out of uh, force or other circumstances, the uh, kidnappers relieved um, their victims, and that is where rescue comes in. So number one, um, the commitment of the parents is responsible. They were able to gather money. In the case of um, Tegina, they gathered money. Some of them sold their assets. Others borrowed the money and then paid uh, these um, uh, kidnappers. Uh, in the case of um, Bethel in Kaduna, the same thing. It was the parents. Um, now, I, it, it would be very unfair not to mention the role of the security forces. There are ongoing security operations virtually in all parts of uh, these locations. In Niger State, there are ongoing security operations. Then there are also ongoing security operations in Kaduna as well as in Zamfara. Now, that may have put pressure on the bandits to conclude on the negotiation that they are doing with the parents of the kids. It's a possibility. Unfortunately, I do not have the facts to uh, corroborate that. Um, so it's a combination of several factors. Another element that I know has um, played out recently is the supply chains of most of these groups have been disrupted. Remember that um, a supply chain has em emerged that is feeding into the industry, the kidnap for ransom in industry. And I'm using these words co consciously. Um, as, as an example, people supply food to them, people supply drugs to them, people supply, supply forgive my use of what, um, prostitutes to them. And so uh, the recent security operations have disrupted this supply chains. And so the likelihood is that their camps are a bit more uh, difficult than they were before the security operations. Are. So a combination of these factors led to um, the re recent releases that, that, that we saw. Before I go back to the group captain, can you tell us, is it likely that these bandits are unified in their structure, in their organization? Are they centrally controlled? Are they in any way linked with the Boko Haram sect or the ISWAP? So one of the challenges that I've seen of recent is the inability of um, several elements within the society to disaggregate the issues we're dealing with. Um, the bandits, as far as I know, are not unified. There may be a cultural element that runs across, and um, one of the most worrying trends that we have seen is the cultural dimension that um, some of these actions present to the, to the leaders of the bandit groups. So the more you abduct, as an example, some pupils, from a school, the more your, your, your profile, your prowess as a commander or leader in, increases. Um, and so it's now like a competition between them. Uh, each camp wants to do something like that so that he or his prowess would increase. And the prowess comes with so many things, the money they are being paid and, and all that. Um, in terms of whether there is a strategic direction that they are trying to pursue, uh, nothing in terms of my research has indicated that. I run a consultancy and we are keeping tabs of all of this. We have identified some major uh, camps that are led by some what I would call people who have shown uh, a kind of um, bestiality that unfortunately uh, should be dealt with, uh, that we are not seeing enough of that at the moment. Now, whether there they, they is a close um, strategic partnership between them 
and deter the terror, terror groups in the Northeast. Yes, unfortunately. And this is something that started as far back as 2014, 2015, where we've seen an attempt by especially the, the, the two major groups in the Northeast, the Jamaat al ahl and al dawati wal jihad and the Islamic State in West Africa province to extend their reach to the Northwest. Now, over time, this uh, partnership has increased. More recently, uh, perhaps uh, to, in order to get funding for their operations, uh, there is that possibility that some of the kidnappings we're seeing is also as a result of this strategic partnership. But this is not peculiar to Nigeria. All over the world where there are instances where terror groups form partnership with criminal groups and where they use the proceeds of the activities of these criminal groups to fund their activities is something that we, is quite common within um, counter-terrorism and counter-insurgency um, studies, unfortunately. So, I mean, we can say that they are not linked at all, or are there some linkages? Um, in summary, there are linkages, and I, I've tried to explain that in my comments. Um, there, are, there are existing linkages, but to say that they're, they're in, in a partnership, no. It's an affiliation that is mutually beneficial, and you have to remember, um, Sheung, that they are operating in the same space. If you use the example of Falgori Forest in Kano, um, when the military operations led to dislocation of the two terror groups in the northeast, they moved into some parts of the northwest, including this forested part, and that's where these bandits hide. So the na natural cohabitation would lead to some form of um, pa strategic partnership, as it were. In terms of the ideological linkage that everybody seems to be looking for, um, there is no finding at the moment that would establish that. We have to remember that, um, especially these bandits in the northwest, their knowledge of um, the scriptures that this uh, terrorist, terrorist groups preach of is almost next to nothing. So the, the ideological linkage is, next, is almost non-existent. The, the partnership is one of uh, criminality, is one of perhaps sometimes weapon acquisition, but um, not, not ideological. Um, Good Captain uh, Sadiq, can you tell us, because uh, there was a time that the governor of Kaduna State, Nasser Arifai, said, Look, anyone still staying in those forests is not the right, is the, they're not the right persons to be there. That, but it's a bandit and uh, people with shady uh, uh, deals or motives are the ones who are in those forests. And his argument at the time is that there needs to be a bombardment on them. But we kind of rescue that we're seeing from that forest. Do you think it's a time to go in the direction of uh, Governor Erufai to storm, uh, to storm those forests, to smoke them out? Because what we have heard from experts to say, look, if you smoke them out, there might be collateral damage because of the proximity of some of these forests to caves and all what a view that innocent people might be living. But is it a, a good time now to start that kind of harsh and force military uh, operations? Well, uh, as somebody who operates on the intersection between uh, human rights, law of armed conflict, and also military operations, I would uh, be cautious about seeking, taking such an approach. Moreover, like you pointed out, uh, there are villagers that have been held captive. What I mean by captive is not as if the bandits are holding them, but for them to tend to their farms, to tend to their animals, they have no option but to remain here. There are stories of I mean, uh, villagers paying uh, tight or whatever. They, they, pay, they, pay, they pay tutelage to this in order to stay. So uh, I would really be wary about you know, uh, uh, bombarding the whole area because we, do, we have not put uh, you know, enough precautionary measures. In uh, law of armed conflict, you are always told to take feasible precautions to ensure that innocent civilians are not harmed. With the fact that we don't even know where some of our children are, with the fact that we know for a fact that some villagers have decided to stay and find a way of living, uh, should I say not peacefully, but to continue their livelihood by paying some money to the bandits, those things are there on the ground. So uh, unfortunately, I do not think we have a clear ground where we'll say this area is occupied 100% by bandits and then we can let loose our weapon systems. So uh, I will really, uh, I will be cautious on that. So how then but, do but we maybe, clear? Because we, we have do. some fire powers now. Then how do we then clear them out? These guys keep taking us uh, children and taking them away into these bushes. 
How do we stop them? And from what we understand and gather, when, is that they travel as much as seven, uh, they travel as much as hundreds of thousands of kilometers away from the uh, urban area or some of these schools or some of these uh, communities where they kidnap and abduct people. Well, back to the term that uh, my colleague here mentioned, that is a rescue. Rescue operation, even for every armed force or any security force, it's a very delicate operation. You always have to remember that the person you are trying to rescue is with these bandits. And at the same time also, you have to understand that these bandits, like I said, we do not have it as a fact that there is one area where it is 100% bandit uh, territory. So for that reason, you have to be very, very careful. You may have the uh, necessary firepower, but it may not be expedient, it may not be wise to just let loose and say that you'll destroy everything there. However, there are some uh, measures that can be taken, maybe in uh, collaboration with the local, uh, like the traditional rulers, the Degachis, the local Mayanguas, if we could find a way on a case-by-case -case basis of sensitizing villages that are around this area to pull out and we're able to ensure that, uh, you know, we have majority of the people out there, we can take that risk. Uh, the, law, the law of war sometimes does not say that, uh, you know, collateral damage must be, must be zero. But then you have to make sure that the military advantage you are going to gain far outweighs the collateral damage you are going to cause. So if you could have ways of trying to alert people and they are able to do so on a case-by-case -case basis, then we could be destroying because we are not talking of one forest, we are not talking of one location. But uh, I would still caution on just going without doing, without just putting this, uh, you know, uh, precautionary measures on the ground of just, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, letting loose our weapon system just to neutralize. I think it will be counterproductive. If you look at what is happening in the northeast right now, um, where we have a lot of uh, some of these uh, former Boko Haram members who are surrendering, uh, over a thousand of them that we understand now that are, that are shown interest that they want to surrender. That's good news, isn't it? It is good news because uh, what I'm saying, as long as I put it simply, if we are going to get more people that are surrendering than people that either Boko Haram or Iswap are recruiting, then definitely we are coming towards, uh, you know, I mean, uh, a slope on the, on the counterinsurgency. Uh, I always want people are discussing this, and I always want people to understand. You see, the, the reality is that an, a non-international armed conflict is very difficult to end. It is not as clean code as an international armed conflict, country A versus country B. Were it to be so, all you need to do is give us your prisoners of war, take your prisoners of war, and everybody goes to his country. But you see, the reality, the, 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 the family links, the cultural links, the so many links that are between this Boko, Boko Haram, who are mostly from that northeast and the larger population, we could not wish it away. First, we could not tell these uh, bandits if they surrender that they should leave Nigeria. You know, it will be manifestly illegal and we will not behave illegal. And secondly, once somebody surrenders, under law of armed conflict, you cannot go ahead now and shoot him after he surrendered. If he's injured and surrendered, or he's not injured, he surrendered, the law says you must take care of him. And Nigeria is signatory to all these laws. Now, at the same time, you do not want to encourage impunity that somebody has violated, has killed, you know, and then he's told to go away. So again, I want people to understand when you talk about this amnesty, what the law of armed conflict said, especially uh, Article 2 of the Geneva Convention, it says at the end of the conflict, Governments should provide as wide amnesty as possible. I'm putting emphasis on these words. At the end of the conflict, as wide as possible to those who have participated in the, in, in the conflict, except, except those that have collected war crimes. And those crimes are, you know, enumerated, murder, uh, you know, rape, burning of village. There are certain crimes. So when we say amnesty, Definitely, the Geneva Convention, uh, you know, uh, Additional Port Protocol 2 said, because it understands that ending a non-international conflict, there is no neat way. There is no easy solution to it. Whatever solution you take, you want to balance justice. You want also peace. You want justice. You want reconciliation. You want to uh, discourage uh, impunity. At the same time, you want this community to heal. So in all honesty, it is a big challenge for the people in Borosid or not, or not as general. They have to sit down. And I'm happy as we are talking today, I had there's a meeting bringing all stakeholders as going in Meduguri. It is not as easy. You cannot take a fixed position that, look, we cannot accept them. 
At the same time, you cannot also take a position that nobody is going to pay for any of his crime they go. So what the law says, and which many people forget, is that the amnesty advocated by international law of armed conflict is a selective amnesty for those with low-level involvement as opposed to those with uh, blood on their hands that have to face the, the law. But again, like I said, we have seen it again in so many countries. There is the people who go, when you say punish, 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 don't forgive me, you are talking of uh, retributive justice. But there's also what is called restorative justice. Restorative justice seeks to balance need for peace, need for reconciliation, and also some sort of uh, compensation for those people that are harmed. So definitely, again, like I said, there is no easy way. Whatever way we take, all these stakeholders, the different groups, they have to give something to get something. In the long run, no matter how we discuss this thing, because, uh, like I say, uh, as, as dramatic as it may sound, the only Boko Haram or insurgent you, have a, you don't have a problem with, either legally or administratively, is the one that you shot during the war. You shot him during combat. That one is a clean, that is the end of that guy. But from the moment you, you, know, you arrest him, or he surrenders, or he's injured, the international laws which Nigeria has signed. Nigeria signed this uh, Geneva Convention Article uh, in 1988, October 1988. Definitely you have some administrative, you have some legal responsibility, no matter irrespective of what they, the, what they did. And I'm going to take it a, a, a stone further. If you, if you punish them, you are going to punish them under the uh, Terrorism Prevention Act. As far as I know, the Terrorism Prevention Act does not have a death a a a a sentence. So, supposing somebody is taken to court, and he's given five years or ten years, if he finishes that, he's still going to back to that community. So the issue of reconciliation must always be factored in. All right. The All leaders right. in uh, yeah. Bono State plus so, the federal government, they have to sit down and think this is out. Let me allow uh, Mr. Adamu to give us uh, the closing thoughts on this one. Uh, give us a final word on your thoughts on this very touchy and very sensitive situation in the Northeast region. Um, thank you, Shewun. Before then, I'll quickly want to add to what um, my co-discussion mentioned regarding the situation in the North Central. Um, two things are very important. Intelligence and then the use of our tactical units. The over nine um, law enforcement and um, the military uh, departments have tactical units. There is nothing wrong with us using intelligence to identify the camps of these uh, bandits and then using tactical units to take out the leadership of those bandits. The American came, Americans came here and showed us how it's done in Sokoto. We, we, should, we can do it and we need to do it. We pay money to these um, um, departments. They need to justify this money that we pay, pay to them, all the tactical units they have. With regards to um, the situation in the Northeast, it's a good development, I agree. Um, when you are dealing with about 9,000, um, you know, uh, as it were, members of um, uh, these two groups, and all of a sudden about a thousand plus of them are surrendering, then you have less to deal with. Um, the good thing is we already have a program in place, the Operation Safe Corridor. Time will not allow me to go into the details of Operation Safe Corridor, but that is what it was um, set out to do. Now, whether what we have on paper as the policy um, direction and that, de that determines what Operation Safe Corridor is, is what is being implemented. Unfortunately, the whole uh, program has been a bit opaque. There is no way of sort of evaluating it. But if what I've seen on paper is what is being done there, then it's enough to deal with this situation. It would be able to determine who is, has committed war crimes, like um, um, Sadiq mentioned, and who is a low-level um, member of that group. And then, of course, at the end of the 16-week week period, that that person would have been put through Operation Safe Corridor. There will be an evaluation evaluation to determine All whether right. he has been de-radicalized, uh, like the objective of um, the whole Operation Safe Corridor is. I must sincerely thank both of you. Mr. Kaberu Adam, Security Consultant, and Retired Group Captain Sadiq Shewu, thank you so much indeed for your time and these insights that you have shared.